Welcome to the Hockey Writers Prospect Corner, a show with our top prospects writing crew, bringing you the latest news, analysis, scouting reports, mocks, rankings, and much more. From the world juniors to the NHL draft floor, from the farm to the NHL, our team covers everything that happens in the world of prospects. So sit back, grab a notebook, and get ready for Prospect Corner. Prospect Corner. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Prospect Corner presented by the Hockey Writers. In today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at the 2023 NHL Draft, going over some late risers, fallers, some late round steals, our favorite players, and some more questions along the way. I am your host, Logan Horn, and today I'm joined by my co-hosts and fellow prospect analysts, Matthew Zator and Peter Barracchini. How are you doing, Peter? Doing great. Uh, draft is right around the corner, all packed, all ready to go. Uh, I'm super excited. It's just a few days away now. Yeah, you're heading to Nashville <laughs> just in a few days. Couple of days. Now. Yeah, a couple wow. of days. Yeah, leaving Tuesday. I believe it's so soon. Nice. So, <laughs> you went last year. Was that your first year? First year going to an actual NHL event other than the combine that I went to previously before. Nice. But yeah, this is going to be the second draft that I'm going to. And I uh, can't pick a better one than to go to than this one. <laughs> yeah, pretty sweet destination city to have a, Absolutely. Have a nice event in there. Are you, are you staying at all after the draft? Um, I got to head back uh, yeah. quickly, but unfortunately. But um, yeah, no no offense to Montreal. It was a great draft experience, but I think Nashville is going to be a l- little bit a little bit <laughs> higher up in terms of excitement, city, whatever, because no offense, I've been to Montreal quite a bit. Gotcha. Yeah, having a, having a new fun spot is great. Uh, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to that for you and for us also, all the coverage you'll, you'll bring for us here. Um, Matt, how are you doing? Doing good. Uh, like I said, the draft is just around the corner. Uh, lots of content out already. We've got, yeah, I mean, it just keeps coming and we're going to have a lot more like so with Peter there and Mark and Amy, our resident photographer too. So we're going to have some, some great photos as well. So really looking forward to this draft uh, coming up. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like you guys are saying, it's just a couple days away. The first round is this coming Wednesday night. If you're listening to this within the first day or two of it being out, <laughs> uh, might've already happened or might be happening right now. Um, and then Thursday we have rounds two to seven. So yeah, it's really, really close. Uh, I'm very excited. I'm like a, like a kid, a couple days before Christmas <laughs> right now. I'm just, I'm so excited. Um, and then we have free agency just days after. Yeah, right away after. <laughs> and also the uh, NHL awards are in Nashville as well. Yes. Like the same weekend, I believe. So there's a lot party, (laughs) a lot going on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So as I said at the top of the show, we're going to take some look at some categories of players that are worth keeping an eye on in the final days leading up to the draft. Um, So yeah, we'll just start right in here with some guys that have been rising lately. Um, Peter, I'll come to you first. Who, who are some guys that uh, you think people one or more, it doesn't have to be multiple, but, uh, that you think people should uh, keep an eye on that have been rising a bit? Um, personally, for me, I think Otto Stenberg is a big riser. I think that U18 tournament really did wonders for him. And, you know, we talked about it in our post-game show or post-tournament show, even stuff leading up to the draft right now. Um, you know, questions about his production at the next level. But then again, mm-hmm. at his age, it's a little bit different when he's still trying to, like, you know, find his rhythm, find his groove and, and his game. Um, he's able to dominate his age level. That 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 is for certain. We again saw that at the U18s. Um, mm-hmm. Really think that because of that tournament, it may have put some of the doubts about his you know skill set and everything else behind him. Um, maybe it, like I know he was kind of like a mid twenties pick. Maybe it vaulted him up into that top twenty, like he did for me. And he's one name that I'm really kind of hoping would get taken early on because of his ability to be creative, but still have that smart two-way game to his repertoire. And that's very hard to find, especially for a player of his age to still have that IQ, but still be very skilled and dynamic with the puck. Mm. Um, that 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 is really big for me. Another one, obviously another suite is going to be Tom Willander. I, I, in my final rankings, I had him at 23. So he has risen up mostly mm. quite a bit. 
from mm -hmm. even from January. Um, I as much as I want him to be a target for the Maple Leafs, even though the Maple Leafs interviewed him, it's very unlikely that he falls. I'm getting the sense that he does go maybe top 20, top 15 because of the defensive game. He raved about his defensive IQ, his physicality and ability to separate player from the puck. And that's very telling for a young defender of that age where he already has that pro mentality in that regard. Um yeah, obviously, offensive game needs to come around. I do think that he's kind of in the similar boat of maybe David Reinbacher, where you want to see more offensive consistency. But then again, Reinbacher is a little bit a ways ahead because of his ability to play at the pro level. Willander still at the junior level. But I'm interested to see where he goes. And I think he is going to be a riser for me this time around. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great call there. Um, Willander, I think... Honestly, I don't think he'll make it past the like 10 to 13 range with teams mm -hmm. like St. Louis, Vancouver, mm -hmm. Arizona, and Buffalo all really needing talented right shot D. I'd even uh, throw Pittsburgh I, in there too. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They'd, they'd definitely be interested as well if he makes it to them. Um, I feel like it's tough to see him pass there. I, I agree with you that he has he has less offense than Reinbacher. I'd say by a a decent bit like you look at Reinbacher's production in a really good Swiss league yeah um as a draft eligible it's you know the league isn't quite at the level of the SHL but his production mm -hmm. as a pro in his draft year is comparable to Rasmus mm -hmm. Dahlin it's mm -hmm. past where David Yurichek and Simon Nemitz were last year like he has a lot of offense to his game uh, personally I believe but I, I love Volander I think it's been uh really entertaining to just watch him rock it up draft boards. And I think he did himself a lot of favors at the combine just in the interviews. Yes. Um, hearing more and more people like, uh, like Matt here talking about him in the Canucks range, maybe uh, <laughs> could be a fun pick there, but who knows? We'll see where he goes. He's, he's been fun to watch though. It's definitely a good riser. Uh, Matt, are there any, are any guys you've, you've seen rising lately that you want to point out here? Well, one guy I'm really warming up to, and I, I know we talked about him quite a bit before, uh, is Dmitry Simashev. Uh, he's mm -hmm. he's a guy that's now been talked about, and, you know, he's a left-hand shot. But, uh, you know, with the Canucks at, at 11, and that'd be a pretty big rise for Simashev to be drafted there. Uh, he's, you know, they seem to be more attuned with getting Russians into the system because of uh, Kuzmenko and and there, you know, Milstein's the agent for a lot of these guys. I oh, yeah. I don't know. I'm pretty sure Simashev is actually his agent too. I don't know. <laughs> he seems to be an agent for a lot of these Russian players. So yeah, he's almost like the assistant GM in Vancouver now. <laughs> all the all the Russians he's brought in. But yeah, I'm warming up to him, looking more into his game, and he's he seems to be a guy that's going to be a really good uh, NHL defenseman. And like like we've said in the past is. Maybe his offense isn't going to be there, but his defensive game is is really good. So I mean, and one of those mm -hmm. one of those defensemen that in the league now you need guys like that. They're the traditional defensive defenseman's not around anymore. You need to be a good skater. Uh, you can't be just a a slow physical guy. Like uh, I mean, Char was a good skater too, but uh, you know, guys that don't skate as well, like Hal Gill, those types of guys just you can't have them in the NHL right now because you need to be able to skate and Simashev definitely knows how to skate and he's a mm -hmm. big guy six foot four and I uh, I think he he's really risen for me like you know when we were talking about that I said oh I, I go for Guliaev because he's more offensively minded you can't teach that stuff like that but uh, Simashev is one of those defensemen that are in demand now in the NHL, you know, guys yeah. like Jacob Slavin in Carolina, you know, they don't get the big headlines, but you need them on your team to win. And, uh, you know, I think Simashev could potentially be a type of defenseman like that. He may have more offense in his game. We'll see. But uh, I'm really, I'm starting to get really impressed with Simashev, just reading more about him over the, over time here. Um, mm -hmm. So he's one. And then um, just echoing what Peter said with Volander, because, uh, he's risen up draft boards for me as well. So there's two defensemen. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, for me. Not not too surprising to see some defensemen rise at the end here because fans and teams are probably a little bit is trying to convince themselves that they're defensemen worth taking super high. But I do think Volander is going to be a great player. I do think Simashev is going to be a great player. 
Um, I think it was Daniel Gee. Uh, he's a he's a scout for Elite Prospects. He was on a podcast recently, and he said, "I don't. I think this is a little over over projecting, but it's possible." He said that Dmitry Simashev uh, skates like Quinn Hughes and defends like Chris Tanev. Um, so you know, <laughs> if those come true at that level, that would be beautiful. I'm sure Canucks fans would love that because they all miss Chris Tanev. <laughs> so would it be and a combination of? If his name would be Quintanov. Yeah, absolutely. Quintanov, <laughs> I, think. I think that's right. That's right uh, he's been he's been a ton of fun to watch though, Simashev. And I, I hope he I hope he doesn't fall too far just because of his contract situation. Although a player like him, it feels like he would need that time anyway if he was in North America. Mm-hmm. So who knows? We'll see where he goes. Uh quickly, I'll just say a couple of guys that I think have been rising a bit. Um, maybe not a ton, but Dalibor Dvorsky, I th- um in what i've been reading and watching and talking with a few people seems like he's like fully solidified himself in the top 10 probably top nine or eight yeah. maybe um and i've heard that the coyotes are really big on him like uh management for uh i think it's aik his all svenskin team this year said that the coyotes talked to them the most about him by far all season so might be someone to watch at sixth overall, unless someone kind of slips out there a little bit and they they want someone else. And someone else I just want to bring up much later in the draft is Damien Clara. Clara, uh, he's an Italian goalie playing in Sweden. A uh, little bit inconsistent, a lot inconsistent actually, <laughs> but he's shown some real flashes of being like a good NHL goalie prospect. He's six foot six, is good athleticism doesn't always track the play well, but when he does and he's on for a game, he's dominant and he's played for Italy a ton in uh, some of the lower ranks for like the U18 uh, world juniors, the U20 world juniors already. And for the men's world championships um, in, I think the, the third or fourth division, something like that Um, should be someone to watch in the late round. He's been a goalie that's rising a little bit, probably going some of the mid rounds, but um, I think he'll be a fun one to watch for a while. Not a lot of uh, Italian players in the NHL. So I'd be rooting for him. That'd be kind of fun. Uh, the flip side now we'll go to, and I'll come to you first with this one, Matt, who are some guys that you've seen kind of falling lately or that you've kind of been, you've kind of been lower on lately than you used to. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of guys, I think kind of just movement on just based on what we've been kind of talking about over time and what seem to the experts starting to go is, uh, guys like, and I don't think this is something that should happen is uh, a guy like Axel Sandin Pelica. It seems like he's being ranked, not seems like he's dropping off from where a lot of people thought he was going to go. Like Valandra is now kind of seems to usurped him, the guy that would be drafted ahead of mm-hmm. uh, of him. So um, I don't think he should be falling, but it just seems like he is. Um, we talked about it the you know with the combine too, and um, not being as highly thought of maybe uh, than before. I, I think it's it's not warranted. I mean, he's done, he's done so much at the U18s. He was really good, the mm-hmm. top defenseman. Um, I don't know why he seems to be kind of falling down a bit, but um, yeah, he's one. And then, uh, you know, Andrew Crystal is another guy that seems to be kind of dropping, even though, like we said, we talked about the combine being uh, one of the better players, but it seems like he's still around kind of dropping down from that where he should be. Uh, so, I mean, those two guys, I think for me are, are maybe the fallers, but I, I can't really pick one that's really dropped off for me. That's it seems like they're just all always around the same areas for, you know, yeah, that's for me at least. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It It's almost like um, it feels like there's, there's some players that we kind of have a consensus on and then the draft combine comes around and you start hearing more and more opinions from, from in the industry. And, and it seems like they just start to kind of slip and slip and slip kind of weird to see Axel Sandin Pelica there. I agree. It seems like he's been sliding a little, mostly due to good play from people around him mm. or, or just like more excitement about players around him. Um, I know he's a little undersized, but it's not like he's five foot nine. He's five eleven. He's almost six feet tall. Um, he defends quite well for his size. Mm-hmm. Like you said, at the U 18s, he was really good for Sweden on their top pair. Um, he'll be really interesting to watch. Um, I, I hope he doesn't fall too far because 
this is another one of those instances of if I see a playoff team draft <laughs> Axel Sandy Pelica this year, that might be the last draw. That might be well, it for me. Look at uh out, what was it? Is it Yuri Yuri Kulik dropped quite a bit? Um mm-hmm. yeah, like late twenties. So. Yeah. Like and then uh yeah, and now he could be in the NHL next year. Yeah. And I mean there was another guy uh it's slipping my mind for some reason. Uh, Nashville drafted him. Joaquin um, Kamel? Yeah, Kamel. Uh, yeah. He's another guy that dropped way off from where we had him um, last yeah. season. So Yeah, it always it's happens. <laughs> yeah, it always it always happens. It would be interesting to see who who falls significantly on draft day like that. Uh, Peter, what about you? Who are some some fallers that you're noticing lately? Uh one of the again, one of them is still one of my favorite players in this draft, and I have him as a top twenty. Um, it, it's Riley Height. Um, I I get the sense that, and even in our in your uh, final consensus uh, combined rankings, uh, you have Riley Height at twenty. Elite prospects have him at twenty six based on the consolidated rankings. Uh, some some have him as that you know late twenties kind of player, even though he does have the upside, he has the puck smart or the puck skills. He has the smarts away from the puck and he plays with some buttons and edge, uh, some edge. I think that, you know, this is a very highly competitive playmaking forward with good speed, strong transitional game, uh, a factor in the offensive zone forces turnovers. And he's very quick in like, you know, creating that separation. And that shows that competitive, style that you know teams need and a very and i'm not saying that he is going to be him but i see the same that i do in brayden points game you know 511 type Mm -hmm. player um has a speed smarts a skill underrated shot so if he's able to work on that shooting it's going to be a big plus towards him don't understand and he almost hit 100 points Mm -hmm. um they were like you know only i think only bedard and andrew crystal had more points than height this season in the WHL. I'll have to go back and double check that. But yeah, I, I, I don't understand why he's fallen so low. I think that kind of like Axel Sandy Pelika, if he goes to a playoff team, that is going to be a huge, huge ad. And just to correct myself, it was Benson and Bedard. Uh, Andrew Crystal had two points less than height. Either way, my point stands because <laughs> highly right. Uh, highly right Riley height <laughs> uh see see how see how I'm going right one. now uh, I'm, I'm very agitated so with it because, you're upset about it. yeah uh Riley height should be a top 20 uh, player I I don't understand that um there's also one more player that you know probably kind of nitpicking here and there but I could kind of see it regardless was Jaden Perron obviously that size this, that, that's when it's just where size is going to be a factor he does need to build up his strength but you can't deny the puck skills that he has and the creativity and in him playing alongside Macklin Salabrini they were just you know working wonders with each other so I think he's going to fall but I th- it's more of a reason to see him fall because he needs to add more strength but Riley height falling because of that overall package it it, it, it's kind of perplexing to me a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I feel like this is the time of the year where um, where consensus starts to drop off on some of the shorter guys. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if I had to give you uh, a very short description of why I think height is falling, it's because he's five foot ten and a half. I think he measured in at the combine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, you know, is a... it whether you think it should be or not, it is a risk factor in GM's minds. Um, So for fallers, I'm genuinely just going to go with everyone under five (laughs) eleven who we thought was slightly (laughs) taller than that. (laughs) Cause like Jaden Perron, Andrew Crystal, uh, like someone I'm going to talk about in a little bit, Timur Mukhanov, Russian who's five foot eight. Um, All these guys, we could talk about how skilled they are all day, but um, if an NHL uh, scouting staff is looking at them and they can't find a spot for them in their future lineup they're not going to be pretty likely to take that mm-hmm. risk um there's not a lot of players that look like team or Mukhanov in the nhl <laughs> not a lot of five eight snipers um <laughs> are there any i don't know um that's debatable <laughs> the but uh cap, probably yeah i guess so actually yeah. that's fair. <laughs> um but that's a that's a one of a kind yeah <laughs> pretty pretty tough to expect someone to be in like the the, the upper echelon of possibilities there. Cole well, those Cockrell, are the kind of players that drop that drop towards the end of the uh, 
of the draft year kind of um especially in when you look at nhl teams and how they rank these players they're a lot lower on them than a lot of us are um and then someone else that i just want to quickly mention is edward shala who uh i believe it was the u18s last year just like burst onto the scene i think he had nine points in six games as an underager in the u18s we were like who is this kid and then he was okay at the Helinka gretzky was inconsistent throughout his league play all year and then it comes to the u18s again and it's like maybe he can get himself on the right track again play against younger players instead of pros and he had less points than he did the year before uh just kind of a kind of a tough year for him a little disappointing um looks like he might slide as far as like the mid to late 20s which is wild because we're talking about in the top 10 for so much of the year um could be a real real good upside pick for someone in the teens or the 20s um because he's shown the flashes he's got a ton of skill with the puck uh he's just really got to work on his his decision making and playing at the the pace of the pro game um i hope he makes it he could be like an absolute steal we could look back on this in 10 years and be like how did he go like 25th overall <laughs> to st louis like that's upsetting um who knows, but uh, he's definitely been kind of sliding a bit in a lot of people's perception. So keep an eye on him sliding on draft day, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. I've got a couple quick fire questions here for you guys. So I want, I want your quick answers and then we will uh, move on to the back half of the show here. So Peter, I'm going to start with you. Who is someone in the draft who you think will be drafted higher than you would take them? I mean, I would like to take Connor Bedard higher than one, but I can't do that. <laughs> um, Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> someone drafted. Sorry, re- repeat the question. Repeat the question. They're going to go higher than you would want them to go. Someone that that is going to be taken too early in your mind. Too early, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I I'm a firm believer in Cohen Zemer. I, I I think that he should be taken higher than where he initially is going to be, and that's usually a second rounder. I think I'm higher on him. With, along with other players that are like, you know, second rounders that should be in that first round conversation because of his goal scoring ability, his uh, competitive edge, his play away from the puck. I think the big knock on him is a skating, but that can always be a quick fix. And just one little tweak here and there can turn him into a quicker, more agile skater. And he's got the finishing power. Uh, teams want goal scorers. Cohen Zemer can do that in bunches. Yeah, he'll be he'll be interesting to watch for sure. Um, follow up actually. Do you have the opposite end too? So that's someone that that you that you would take higher than uh, than the consensus right now. Is there someone on the on the other side? Someone that maybe will sneak into the first round that you're like, I don't know about that. <laughs> Still, Daniel Boot. Um, I, hmm. I, I he's get like he has shown a little bit more consistency, and he's using his size more to his frame. I'm still a little bit wary on his play away from the puck. That to me is the biggest thing. Obviously he is a winger. He's not a centerman. He, if he does tend to flow, uh, that's going to be a big decision maker because that uh, decision factor or decision maker or big factor. I'm losing my train of thought there for a quick second. All but good. All good. Everyone is saying that, you know, Oh, you know, Andrew Crystal is floating away from the puck, you know, tends to not be engaged or engaged in the play at all which is why he'll fall, but everyone, you know, is saying the same thing with boot, but he's going to be higher. And it's just because he's a bigger player. So like that seven inches me, taller. <laughs> yeah. So that's why, like, I'm a little bit wary on him and be, and still putting him in my first, he's risen up to an early second, but I still probably wouldn't take him in the first, if that's the case. Okay. That's fair. I get it. Um, I don't know. I just, I watch him play and I can, I can dream of like, I don't know who's who would kind of line up like Alex Tuck or like yeah um maybe like Rantanen with less puck skills mm-hmm. like I can kind of I can kind of see it and I think NHL teams look at someone that big and and hope they get a different look in their top six someone mm-hmm. someone with a totally different different play style but uh I understand some of the concerns Absolutely. and he does have some same concerns <laughs> as guys that are going in the opposite direction but just yeah. because you're massive you, you kind of get the benefit of the doubt in the nhl world so if he showed a little <laughs> bit more consistency game to game i think i would probably have him in that first but sure. still a little bit wary as a result of that yeah okay i i think it'll be interesting to see him uh move up into the khl soon and see what he yes. can do there against grown men because he's got the frame to compete there oh yeah <laughs> Um, Matt, can you, can you give me one of each of those as well? Someone that, that you think will go a little higher than you want and someone that'll go a little lower than you want. 
Well, I'm going to say one guy and similar to what, you know, Peter's saying with boot is uh, David Edstrom. Uh, he's, he's six, three, 187 and one of the better players in front of the net and teams love that. I mean, even though they, you know, the same about guys, big guys and smaller guys are more around in the NHL now, but those six, three big guys that can, you know, that can play in front of the net and be hard to move. I are still in demand and Edstrom's seems to be around a guy that could be push himself into the first round. Um, a lot of rankings have him maybe going 30, 31, uh, early in the second, but I think he's going to end up being in the first just because of that size and that ability to be in, to play in front of the net and being really effective there. Uh, I don't think he should be a first rounder. I think early second is probably where I'd put him, but teams just teams love those types of players still. And there are certain teams that love them more than others. Uh, and I think he's going to end up being a first rounder, even though he probably shouldn't be. And on the other side is Gavin Brindley. I, I think just because of his size, I, I have this really bad feeling that he's going to end up being a second rounder and he shouldn't be just seems like he's going to be a stank over and over all over again. And a guy and a team like the Dallas Stars, who's a playoff team uh, in the second round. And um, I'm hoping like the Detroit Red Wings pick them, maybe. Uh, and that that'd be fine because they're, you know, they're a rebuilding team. They're a team that needs guys like that. So I'd be okay if they got him in the second round. I just feel like he's going to drop into there. And he's even though he has the talent and that player style that should be a first round pick. So Gavin Brindley, for sure. Uh yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I feel so like Edstrom that's Brindley, yeah. Nice. Those are those are good picks. I feel like I've seen a lot of people in mock drafts having uh Brindley go to Carolina at 30th. Ugh. Um which like I totally understand. He feels like the kind of player that they'll they'll take a reach on when mm-hmm. other people are a little too scared off. But if they pass on him too, I think uh Twitter's going to like blow up. <laughs> Everyone's going to start panicking and being like, "What is what's happening? What happened?" <laughs> it's going to be like, like Lane Hudson yeah. last year. Yeah, basically, yeah. I think I think there's a there's a decent shot. Maybe Andrew Crystal is that one of those guys feels like they'll kind of be be the uh, the sacrifice that goes into the second round. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'll quickly give mine. So someone that I think will probably has a good shot of going in the first round at the very end, or at very least like really soon after, is Danny Nelson from the NTDP. Um, I'm really intrigued by him as a prospect. He's really big. I very recently uh, switched from being a defenseman to a center. Well, played the wing sometimes too this year, but played played down the middle a bit as well. Um, really intriguing, decent defensively as a forward, which makes sense because he was a defenseman. Um, but there's just, I don't see the offense that often. I'm a little nervous about it. Um, wouldn't be surprised to see him go early because he's massive, uh, has the potential to score and be a middle six forward center, maybe. Um, and teams will take that bet readily. Um, you could also play him on defense if you decided that's where he was better, which is wild because we don't see that a ton anymore. Players switching right before the NHL, switching uh, from forward to D. Um, and someone who I think is going to go later than I would like is Grayson Sachin. Uh, we've talked about him for a while on here. I think he's a first rounder. Uh, he's got the tenacity he's got the the speed and some of the fastest hands in the draft like probably top five um he's got a lot of brandon hagel in him like there's this one play where he just was getting like tripped the entire way and as he was falling he passed it little saucer pass to his teammate on a two-on-one and they scored and it's just like he just does not give up he works super hard uh and i think the only reason he's not getting attention is because he's 511 and he played on the third line for the last half of the year because the seattle thunderbirds were so stacked but mm-hmm. i think he deserves to go late first probably but i think he'll probably be on the board a little longer than that we'll have to wait and see though all right so we're going to take a quick break here uh, but we'll be right back after a quick word from the hockey writers 
Interested in writing for the Hockey Raiders? If you have experience writing about hockey, are passionate about the sport, and are looking to take your writing to the next level, the Hockey Raiders could be the place for you. Here at THW, you will have the opportunity to hone your craft at one of the world's largest and most respected hockey publishers. You will have control over what you write, be able to seek out media credentials, and be supported by a large network of writers and editors. Plus, you'll get paid for doing it. If you're interested and want to know more about team openings and requirements, please visit the Write for THW page on the Hockey Raiders website. A link to that page is also listed in the description. All right, so now to finish off uh, some of our draft talk here in our last show before the draft, uh, I want you guys to give me a player or two that you think will be a steal when we look back on this draft a few years down the road. So give me someone you think will go in the second round or later. That's as you can't tell me someone in the first is a steal unless you think like, I don't know, Ryan Lannard is going to fall to 20 or something, but please don't say that because I don't, I don't believe you. <laughs> um, Peter, I'll come to you first here. Who, who are some guys that you think might be a steal when we look back on this draft? Um, I'm going to say Bradley Nadeau from the Penticton bees. Um, mm. Penticton V, sorry. I don't know why I said bees. Um, I, the more like I have to credit you Logan on Bradley Nadeau uh to watch him a little bit closer because he has just been absolutely fantastic and you can see why teams are very high on him but you know because of how deep this is of a draft it is he probably Mm -hmm. won't crack that top 30 but if he's going to be taken in a mid second round range i think that's going to be very ideal but if he continues to fall because there's i don't know if teams had that sort of skepticism where the bchl maybe isn't you know, where it is compared to other leagues, like, you know, Mm -hmm. USHL is showing its dominance, AJHL, but then again, you know, it's kind of like the same junior level because it's just in BC. Um, If there's some of that, like, hesitation, there shouldn't be any hesitation because he is a very dominant and very skilled and gifted player. I think if he falls anywhere beyond 45, I think that's going to come out as a complete steal for whoever drafts him. Yeah, I'd agree. I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Nadeau. I've been talking about him for a while here. One of the best shots in the draft period. I, yeah, if he's available in the middle of the second round, that would be insane. But also, you know, like you said, not a ton of spotlight on the BCHL these days. Um, So maybe it wouldn't be so crazy. Might, mm. might happen. I actually have one yeah. more in mind. I forgot to for pick it. one. Um, and I, I'm also going to say Kerry Terrans from the Erie Otters. Mm. Um, you look at the Erie Otters this year, they were not great at all. And Mark, uh, Mark Shai can, uh, you know, attest to that because of how low they were in the standings, but for Terrence to have sort of like a 30 goal season, um, leading the charge for the Otters, um, you put him in on any other team, he's going to put up like lights out numbers so for him to hit 30 goals on a poor team that struggled all the year i think it's a good indication of where he is and not not only mm-hmm. that he's got great speed um you know great edges was on that second line was in that middle six role for team usa at the u18s and looked very great i believe he was playing mm-hmm. with oliver moore on that wing but either way he showed you know the shot the speed the skill the edge work that he has um could be, I'm not sure if he will make it into the second round, but if he's going to be in that mid tier range, like third or fourth, I think he has a chance of being a very good pickup as well. That's a great one. Yeah. I feel like he really, really showed what he was capable of when he's in a slightly better situation with the, mm-hmm. with USA, with some better teammates. Um, ton of fun to watch at that tournament. I, I agree that that would be a really good pick in the third, fourth rounds if he's there. Um, Matt, who, do you have any any draft deals that you're looking at coming into this draft? There's a few. Um, so I'll highlight a couple. Uh, one guy is the second half of the dynamic duo with Bradley Nadeau, and that's Idar Suniev. And mm-hmm. he's a guy that's like, yeah, his skating needs work. Uh, his mechanics need work. I mean, that can be fixed. I mean, a skating coach can iron those types of things out. But his other skill is just, he was the, like, if you're looking at like a Connor, Connor McDavid, Leon Tricidal, that's way above, but they were like that. Both ridiculously high scoring forwards in the BCHL. And uh, mm-hmm. Suni has that type of guy. He's great wrist shot, a natural type goal scorer. Like I guess say skating may hold him back a bit, but he's got that hockey IQ and and that shot and just being a 
one of those goal scores that you, you can't teach. And uh, a lot of rankings have him going in the, maybe the third round. Uh, if he, if he goes there, you're going to have a guy in the NHL, I think being, like I say, his skating will, will determine things. If it does improve, mm-hmm. I think he mm-hmm. could be a really good middle six guy that um, great on the power play and will score 20, 25 goals consistently. Um, whatever team gets him or wherever they get him is going to have a guy that's going to be able to do that. Um, another guy is Felix Nielsen, a uh, Swede centerman from uh you know, he's one of those guys, again, two-way type centerman ranked to go maybe in the late second, early third. I'm hoping he goes in the third because the Canucks have a draft pick down there. But, uh, you know, one of those great uh, two-way centermen that could be a really good third line guy, um, maybe provide some offense down in that bottom six as well. And he, he's another one that I'm really looking forward to seeing where he goes, because I think he's going to be ending. He's going to end up being a really good bottom six center. Um, yeah. So those two for sure. And then I'll just throw William white law as well. Cause uh, he's gotten less talk lately. And I think he's going to end up falling into that third round. I'm hoping sec. I'm hoping he goes in the second. Cause that's where I think he deserves to go. Um, lots of high skill, but again, undersized. And I think that's probably why he's going to drop. But again, that skill level and creativity he has and the work ethic is something that is going to end up having him go to the NHL sooner rather than later. So I'm I'm going with those three guys are going to be nice. steals wherever they go, I think. And they're going to end up being in the third, fourth round. They're not yeah, going to go later. Yeah. Nice. Those are some great ones as well. I'm just going to throw out a few really quick, kind of in order roughly of how early they could go. So Cohen Zemer um peter you were talking about him before i believe um feels like he's a first round talent the skating is certainly an issue and matt kind of like you were saying with suniev it's kind of the determining factor whether he'll be an amazing ahl player or like a good second liner possibly if if it really takes some some steps in the right direction uh pun not not intended um (laughs) skating steps but um uh (laughs) feels like he could fall into the 40s 50s even maybe and if you get him past 40 i feel like that could be a pretty valuable pick yeah. um even if you can just get his skating up a little bit and get him into your lineup um someone that uh seems like they could go maybe late second or third that i would take earlier is felix unger uh mm. he is a swede and he was phenomenal all year this year uh one of the best uh slot passers i've seen at this age which is just such a wild thing um i think it was um uh lassie allenin of uh, elite prospects does a lot of manual stat tracking and from their whole data set of draft eligible players the only player with more slot passes per 60 minutes in this draft class more than unger sorum was will smith (laughs) um so he gets he gets into the offensive zone with the puck a ton and draws a lot of attention and is a really excellent playmaker into the slot gives his teammates a really good chance to score. Uh, I think it'd be a little bit of a sleeper pick in the the second, third rounds. Next is Timur Mukhanov, where I mentioned draft. Uh, a lot of um, mock drafts have him maybe in the third round, but genuinely I think he'll go later than that. Cause he's got the double whammy of being Russian and five foot eight, <laughs> but he scored a ton this year. He has a great shot. He's a really great skater. Um, if you literally took all of his skills and talents, and then you just made him four inches taller, he'd be a first rounder probably, but he's five foot eight, you know, changing <laughs> that. So I, I don't know. He's probably going to go fourth round or later, but um, if he hits, it could be a really, really good player genuinely um and my last one is someone that i have no idea where he's gonna go maybe third fourth maybe later uh hudson malinowski he played for the brooks bandits this year in the ajhl teammates with aiden fink uh he's an overager he didn't get drafted last year um he was playing in like a a triple a u18 league last year um didn't get a lot of attention there joined the ajhl was the I believe the rookie of the year for the whole CJHL, so all of Canada's uh, junior A leagues, um, and he was phenomenal. He's had a massive growth spurt in the last year too, which I think is why he's got more more attention around this draft. Um, but it feels like if he kind of gets used to the size of his body, it gets a little more physical. 
uh, and a little more engaged defensively. I think he has a really good chance of being a bottom six forward in the NHL that you get in the fourth round or later, which would mm-hmm. be pretty valuable. Uh, so those are my guys. Uh, Malinowski's one, though, definitely that I feel like hasn't been talked about enough, and I, I want to mention him. So uh, we've got one last question here, and we're going to combine it with prospects of the week since no prospects are actually playing. <laughs> and there's no reason to try to do that on its own because it's just I like this guy. So we're going to talk about guys that we like instead of guys that are playing because no one's playing. So obviously, if you listen to this show, you'll pick up on some of these guys anyway. But uh, I'm going to ask you guys to give me a short list. Don't. Don't start going crazy on your list of some of your, your favorite guys in this year's draft. Um, so, Matt, I'll come to you first here. Who, who are some guys you you would consider to be your, your favorites in this year's draft? Not necessarily the best, but just the guys that you, you gravitate towards. Matthew Wood. <laughs> that's, that's so surprising. It's so Rocker. surprising. <laughs> Gavin Brindley, I, I talked about. That's another surprise. I, I, those two for sure. I, I'll go. I, I'm really, like I said, Simashev has now become one of my favorites. I, I think he, he's, mm-hmm. he's really good. Uh, Axel Sandin Pelica, uh, another one. Um, I'll pick another couple just to go. Uh, Otto Stenberg has really started to be one of my favorites as well because mm-hmm. I think he could end up being a second line center. Uh, from what how we played at the at the under 18s and his leadership too. I think he's going to be a captain in the NHL at some point as well. And um, to round it out, I'll go uh, to round out with uh, Andrew Crystal. Cause again, mm-hmm. another undersized I, and I love undersized players. So they're, they're right there. And then uh, I'll, I'll one more William White law. Cause he's been my favorite from the beginning. So there you go. Yeah, absolutely. You've talked about him all year. I remember <laughs> our, our early look at the that was my first uh, central scouting thought. rankings. You're a huge fan. <laughs> um, I'll throw out a couple of mine real quick. Uh, Bradley Nadeau is one that I've been a big fan of Aiden Fink to finish off my junior A guys. Uh, I won't stop talking about Fink these days. Uh, Oscar Fisker Molgard is someone I'm huge on. It's just a really high floor defensive forward. Uh, with some potential and then someone that's I've just been liking his game more and more and more and uh, I know a lot of people are in the same boat but Ryan Leonard I'm just a huge fan of his I think he'll be really successful in the NHL Um, plays a lot bigger than he is which is good because he's not huge but I I don't think that'll be an issue for him sometimes players just have skills where their height kind of just is not considered anymore kind of like Bedard it's just like oh he's five foot 10 and a half or whatever it's like who cares he's bedard like we, we know who he is and he's got so much other skill that we don't have to worry about that and ryan leonard fits there a little bit for me too even though he's taller um peter give me some of your favorites from this year's draft who do you got uh both of you mentioned a couple um otto Semberg and gavin brindley obviously tom Verlander, mm-hmm. huge fan of his riley height again going through players that we've already mentioned on this show mm-hmm. But other ones that, you know, that we didn't talk about, uh, Ethan Gauthier, um, really mm-hmm. like his tenacity and edge that he plays with, but has the speed and skill to still have that offensive game. Um, Oliver Bonk uh, and Tanner Molendijk, they are two more quiet defenders in terms of like overall skill, but they're very smart and very effective. And everyone's wondering, well, why are you so high on Bonk? Why are you so high on Molendijk? And nothing stands out about them, but that's precisely why. They have yeah. the smarts and they're very sound defensively, but when they jump in offensively, you do start to take note of their game. Um I'm still very high on Casper Houghtonen. I think despite having a bad year and some inconsistencies, injuries and all that, he did start to peak up again at the U18s. He started to display that shot that really resonated with me and his ability to have that speed and physicality. And same with Carson Rakoff too. That shot and uh, hands that he has, he was uh, MVP of the top prospects game for a reason. Um those are some of the players that I'm really high on or some of my favorite ones. So there's that mix of smarts, speed, skill. Obviously, each player has like their own strength, but those mm-hmm. are the things that I'm looking at. And those are some prospects that really are my favorite. Yeah, absolutely. Those are some great picks there as well. I can't wait for the draft. I'm very excited. <laughs> it's going to be a ton of fun for us. Um, but that actually, that does it for us this week. Um 
Thank you all for tuning in to another episode of Prospect Corner. Make sure you subscribe to the Hockey Writers YouTube channel to make sure you catch all our new episodes. Uh, in the immediate aftermath of the draft, you'll see some new episodes on there. And also make sure you check out our site, thehockeywriters.com, for tons of coverage of the draft. We have live coverage and we'll have tons of articles coming out during the draft and immediately following again. So check that out. Anything you're looking for about the draft, we'll have something on it. I guarantee. <laughs> uh, thank you, Peter and Matt, as always have a nice trip, Peter. I'll thank you. We'll see you soon. Um, and thank you all for watching this week's episode of prospect corner. We'll see you next time.